the African lion is under threat. In the wild, numbers are in decline. In Zimbabwe, British conservationist David Yulden is working on a radical program that may help save this iconic predator by helping captive bred lions develop the skills they would need in the wild. That's it. When they have the means to survive, the lions will live in 10,000 acre enclosures. All human contact will be withdrawn and they must hunt for themselves. In years to come, they will breed and their cubs will be released into the wilds of Africa. Dawn breaks over Antelope Park. Home to the African Lion Rehabilitation and Release into the Wild program. Here, human handlers work with captive bred lions in a controversial and potentially dangerous conservation project. As the African bush slowly comes to life, two of the reserve's youngest residents have just woken up. Jabari and Jelani are brothers. At five months old, they're still in the early stages of the release program. Their mother was raised in captivity, so can't help them develop the skills they'd need to survive in the wild. Morning, boys. Hello, little one. At Antelope Park, that responsibility is given to the lion handlers and David Yulden. David's passion for conservation brought him to Zimbabwe five years ago from his home in London. He started to work with the lions as a volunteer and it changed his life forever. Knowing that you as an individual are assisting them in their growth um, is incredible. It's just such a privilege to be part of. Come on, boys. Come on, boys, come. Come on. Out in the bush, Jabari and Jelani are very unconfident. Everything is still very new to them. Jabari is very much the bolder of the two. Uh, he tends to lead, and Jelani is very, very easily frightened at this point uh, and definitely tends to follow. These daily walks give David and lion handler Mackay and Kube a chance to assess the cubs in the open and see how their basic hunting skills are developing in a wild environment. Oh, he's going to stalk his brother. Jabari, the bigger and more confident cub, is already showing strong predatory instincts. That might not look like the best stalk in the world, but it's these, those just early little uh, movements and a, and a run towards a sibling. That part of play is really, really important in terms of practicing their hunting skill when they get older. Uh, come, come. Come on, let's go. Come on. Come on. As part of their development, Come David on. wants to observe how the cubs will react when they see prey for the first time. On, but that means leading them onto the open savanna, a step the cubs have never taken before. We're going to see if we can encourage them out here. On the edge of the scrubland, Jelani, the more nervous cub, hesitates. Come on. Come on, lad, He's go. lost sight of his brother and doesn't have the confidence to step out on his own. Come on. Come on, lions, come. Jabari is soon by his side. Jabari, Jelona, come. And leads his brother out onto the open plain. As you can see, we're out here on the grass and they are just much more cautious. They move a lot slower. In the wild, lion cubs are often killed by other predators, like hyenas or leopards so their instincts tell them to avoid open areas where the grass is short and there's nowhere to hide. Just spotted some impala. Uh, probably not gonna hunt them down, but these first experiences of seeing game uh, is all good for their development later on. Okay, all you need to do now is turn around. Ah. 
What's interesting is now we've come out onto the open grassy area, they're a lot more nervous, and that results in they will stick closer to us, they'll be much more aware of what's going on around them, including now having spotted the impala. The natural instinct is to be interested. And at this age, they're not going to do much more than just watch and learn. But each time they see a herd of impala, they'll feel a bit more confident. And probably in a couple of months' time, they'll actually start walking towards them. That's how that hunting instinct is developed. It's no surprise that Jabari, the more confident cub, is the first to take an interest. Is he hiding? You see, that's good. He doesn't need to be taught to go and try and hide himself. One important thing about this program is we believe that the hunting instinct is already there. It just needs the opportunity to develop. For now, all Jabari can do is sit and watch. But even observing the impala's behavior at a distance can teach Jabari an important life lesson. If he studies the way the impala move and the way they interact with each other, he'll gain a significant advantage when he starts to hunt. Obviously at this age, it's very, very early days. But by two and a half years old, they should be well seasoned hunters and then they're going to be released into a controlled wild environment where they're going to have to be able to hunt for themselves and w live in a socially stable pride. So it's a long journey for them, but just from this morning, showing interest on, on the impala that we've met, they've started that journey. On the other side of the reserve, there's a problem. Lion manager Leanne Marnock has called in wildlife vet Dr. Keith Dutlow to treat one of the program's older lions, a female named Dakia. Dakia is 13 months old. She lives with her brother Demisi. And Demisi likes to play rough. She's suffered an injury to her face and the wound is refusing to heal. Leanne and the handlers work with the lions every day. Demisi and Dakia see them as dominant members of the pride, but getting hands-on with lions of this age is not without risk. Has he calmed down? And Demisi has a mischievous side and likes to be centre of attention. Demisi. Hello, girlies. Hello, boys. Uh, can you just... Try and keep him occupied. Dakia, come, Gilly. Hey. When Keith tries to examine Dakia's injury, brother Demisi gets agitated. For everyone's safety, he's moved into a different enclosure. Hello. The lion's claws are very, very dirty from all the rotting meat. When they play with each other, they quite often get infections if they break the skin. I mean, if you focus up here, you'll see this pus coming out of here. Left untreated, an infection like this could lead to septicemia and could be fatal. Keith decides he has no option but to operate. Yeah. yeah. Just keep it out and stick it in that blue crate because yeah. it's got the emergency drugs in it. Dakia will be darted so Keith can work on her abscess quickly and safely. You're going to go to sleep for a bit. Easy. Dakia, look at me. Hello, big girl. Hello. Good girl. All done. Good girl. All done. Okay, just take the time.
the sedative begins to take effect. We'll recover our eyes with the cloth because the drug doesn't cause the eyelids to shut and it doesn't stop the reflexes of the eyes. So if they're sitting in the sun and the light shines directly onto their retinas, it could actually damage their eyesight. The team has to work quickly. Dakia could have an adverse reaction at any time. They monitor her heart rate to make sure nothing goes wrong. Basically, you have to make a pretty big hole there for drainage. As you can see the pus oozing out of there because it closes up all the time. You never quite get rid of the bacteria that are in there that are causing the infection. Very often with these claw wounds, the skin pulls away from the tissue underneath. And until you start having a dig around, you don't know how big it is. But you can see when I started, we were just here. And now the extent of this hole is actually down here. There's a lot of scar tissue around there. And we're just flushing betadine into here to flush out any bacteria and any old pus. And then we'll stick her onto a new antibiotic for about a week or so. Keith injects Dakia with antibiotics and painkiller and a reversal drug to bring her round. She should be up in a few minutes. Okay. Two more minutes. Okay, we're letting Demisa back in. He's looking a bit stressed, he's a bit worried about his sister. So we let him in. Go on, boy. It's good that the vets have cleaned it out and we'll see the next couple of days after her next course. Hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll get better. At Antelope Park in Zimbabwe, a controversial conservation program is underway. Over 80 captive bred lions are developing the skills they'd need to survive in the wild, under the guidance of human handlers, including British conservationist David Yulden. One thing I think that I've been able to gain on this program that most other people haven't is I've been able to see the same lion day in, day out, watch those social interactions from very, very close up. That's, of course, an incredibly difficult thing to do in the wild. So I really think that there are some there are some things that we can learn from watching these lions here that we can apply out in a wild situation. Off you go then. David often works with field researchers, keen to learn more about lion behavior. Five-month-old brothers Jabari and Jelani make perfect subjects. They may look identical, but their characters are very different. Research supervisor Sibo Nkube and project volunteer Natalie Post are collecting data for a student from the University of Exeter using mirrors to document character traits in lions. We want to pick out which lions are bold, which lions are timid, characteristics that will help us also in other stages of the program as we set up our release pride because once we understand the character of the cubs it also helps us in grouping lions, particular personality traits in the pride because they'll have different roles they play in the pride. It's well known that lion cubs don't recognize their own reflection. They think the image is another cub and a possible threat. Don't watch the big nasty mirror coming. In the enclosure, David is on hand to reassure the cubs. Okay. Here we go. Jabari, the more confident cub, is the first to investigate. He holds his ground in front of the reflection, but Jelani is unsure and moves away. They're both quite curious about everything. Jabari is definitely the one that is prepared to stand in front of his image, mm -hmm. whereas Jelani seems to almost be 
trying to find where the other club is. He's moving off from side to side and is looking past the mirror. Um, the most interesting thing is this vocalisation, and that isn't something I've ever heard in cubs before. I am surprised. I was expecting them to run away <laughs> because they're still quite young because we did something similar to cubs that were slightly older than them in Zambia. And the moment they saw the mirror, they just ran away and they wouldn't even move more than a metre close to the mirror. They would just approach it a bit and then run away. So I was expecting a similar reaction to those cubs because they're still quite young. But yeah, I'm impressed. Good boys. Sibo's findings confirm what David witnessed on the walk. Jabari is fearless, but Jelani is still unsure and looks to his brother for reassurance. It's up to David to build his confidence so that one day he can become a successful member of a pride. It's been two weeks since the park vets operated on Dakia's face. Afternoon, Cubs. Hello. David and lion handler McKay and Kube have come to check on her progress. How is that doing? It looks better. Hey, my boy, out the way. We recently treated uh, Dakia here for an abscess that she has on her cheek. Um, and just before we take them out on a bit of a walk, just thought it gives me a chance to have Will he behave? Um, just gives me a chance to have a quick look and see how it's getting on. Um, it's looking a lot less raw, um, and I think it's gone down a little. So she's well on the mend, but she's been absolutely fine throughout, behaving perfectly normal. It's not giving you any hassle, is it? No, who's a good girl. So we've got Dakia here, the female, and our male, Demisi. Hey. These lions are good walking lions especially with the dummies he always leads. They are very calm, you can play with them. Uh, they, they are so good. Well, it is hot, so we'll make it a nice gentle walk. Just get you outside, eh? Come on, come, come to Kia. Walking out with lions of this age is potentially dangerous. Come on, come on boy, come. That's it. David and McKay don't have the safe refuge of a jeep or rifle. Their safety depends on David's ability to maintain his position as leader of the Pride. Come on. We're not going far, kids. Come on. David is taking the lions to a watering hole to give them a break from the intense African sun. In the extreme heat, lions will sleep for more than 20 hours a day, conserving their energy for hunting at dawn or dusk. One thing with water is it just cools them down a bit. It'll make her a bit lively. And as you can see, she's now looking around for something naughty to do. Her brother, I think, is about to be the focus of a, a play attack. These two are brother and sister, and, you know, like any family, siblings set out to annoy each other once every so often. <laughs> this play behaviour has a lot more meaning behind it. Just watching their behaviour and how they interact with each other, you start to pick up just small elements of their characters each time. You'll see which ones are the bolder ones, which are more playful. Um, and what we're trying to do is see 
how does what we observe in their character relate to how they might be in a release pride? In the wild, lions often hunt near watering holes where prey species gather to drink. So being confident around water gives them a distinct advantage. There are not many lions that will go that deep, to be honest. They really don't like getting their whiskers wet. But Demisi is a real water baby from day one. Dakia, if she notices he's got something, she'll probably come over and try and steal it, but it's very rare that she'll go in to get her own toys. <laughs> in a successful pride, the female lions do most of the hunting, and David has high hopes for Dakia. All of this behavior is just fantastic for their development. You can see they're so calm and confident out here. And that's what all of the previous months have led up to. For example, Dakia here is extremely playful. Well, playful cubs often tend to go on and be very, very good hunters if they can concentrate. I think Dakia is going to be a very good hunter. Soon, Dakia and Demisi will be taken on their first real hunt. The stakes will be raised as they take another step closer to eventual release. It's October and Zimbabwe is entering the rainy season. At Antelope Park, the wet weather offers a welcome break from the intense African heat. Out on the savanna, David Yulden and lion handler Ticha Zishiri are working with Jabari and Jelani. The cubs are now six months old. Over the last few weeks, they've made good progress. Ah, we're getting into the thick stuff. That's fine, we can go that way. Their confidence has grown, and the two brothers are happy to explore on their own. More interested in leading the walk than following. You having fun, boys? Wow. Today, David's going to encourage the cubs to climb for the first time. This tree is a long-standing friend of, of the park. Many a lion has learned to climb on this tree. Um, they might be a little small at this age too, because it's quite steep. Uh, but it's really good, all the lions love it. From its branches, you've got a great view of the savanna. Um, they can see what game is here. So they really, really enjoy it. Not all lions can climb as it goes, but it's a good start. Jabari, the bigger and more confident cub, is the first to tackle the tree. Come on. There we go, there we go, come on, good boy. Not very stable, are you? Come on. Good boy. There we are. Lions are actually a little nervous when they're in trees because they're not particularly steady. Not to be outdone, Jelani joins his brother. Come on, you can pull yourself up. Pull yourself up. In the wild, some lions climb trees to escape the hot ground and go in search of a light breeze to cool themselves down. Lions are not natural climbers. Ooh, you're right. But it's a useful skill to master. In 12 months time, the cubs will learn how to hunt for themselves. And even at this young age, they're already discovering some new techniques. You see that Jabari is just ankle tapping. Uh, Jelani. That's obviously, it's part of their play, but it's an important part of their hunting strategy later on. Particularly with smaller, faster prey like Impala, you run up behind it, ankle tap it, it trips over, uh, and then you can grab it. 
So this is just the very, very first stirrings of that hunting technique coming in. You don't have to teach it. They just, it's natural. And provided you can give them an area where that play can happen, then that hunting instinct will develop. <laughs> They're having a great time. Yeah, really. <laughs> Adult lions must know their territory intimately. And the cubs are already investigating every sight, sound, and smell. You get quite a lot of mongooses around here. So there's a network of holes all over the place. Obviously, mongooses, that smells good. Uh, so quite often you'll find they'll just have a good dig around and see what they can smell. The cubs walk out every day. They still have a lot to learn. And on such little lions, every new adventure can take its toll. They're getting tired there. Part of the release program, more than 50 staff and volunteers work with lions of all ages. It can be dangerous, so for everyone's safety, the lions are housed in enclosures. Living in a group of four adolescent lions are brother and sister Sango and Swahili. They share a close bond, but Sango is about to reach sexual maturity, so must be moved away from his sister. Head guide Fanwell Nsingo has worked at Antelope Park for four years, and he hand-reared the two lions. Separating the two, um, Swahili is really going to miss uh, her brother Sango very much. You know. Life is not going to be easy for him in the next uh, maybe two, three days. Today, Sango will be moved into the enclosure next door to share the territory of two older males. It's a dangerous introduction, which will be led by David. Morning. How are you doing? Good. Out in a wild situation, once Sango is kicked out of his pride, it's quite likely that he will encounter males who have been kicked out of a different pride and they'll form a coalition. Not necessarily the easiest introduction in lion society. Uh, males tend not to be so accepting of each other. To avoid exposing the lions to high levels of stress, David and his team must work quickly. OK, first step is just to put the three girls into their management enclosure and leave Sango in his main one. OK, there's one. Come on. Come on. Come on. Right, one to go. Swahili is last to walk through, leaving Sango on his own. Good boy. Next stage, get those two boys into their management at the far side, and then we can prepare to put them together. Echo and Itosha are brothers. They are six months older than Sango. They're bigger and stronger. Hello. To help the introduction go smoothly, the brothers have been living in the enclosure next door to Sango. The males can see each other through the fence, but no one knows how they'll react when they come face to face. No. You've been nice to Sango, eh? Itosha in particular might be a bit more aggressive. Echo can be friendly, but also doesn't always take to new lions that well. So. We're going to use some meat to keep them occupied during the first introduction. We found many times in the past that that's just helped lower the aggression levels. Is Sango going in first? Worst case is they straight attack Sango, and Sango is unable to defend himself. At that point, we'll have to make quite a lot of noise to distract them from the fight. It's I'm just going to have to play this one by ear. 
but the odds are definitely stacked in these guys' uh, favour at the moment. Okay, everyone happy to do this? Cool, fingers crossed everyone. Male lions are fiercely territorial. In the wild, they can fight to the death. Sango must stand his ground. Escape on Ghani now. Come on, boys. Echo can't find his share of the meat and heads straight for Sango. Yeah, it's hard beats, yeah. When Sango was challenged, he protected his meat by turning his back on Echo and growling a warning. He stood his ground, and Echo quickly lost interest. For David and Fanwell, it's a huge relief. Today has gone really as well as I could possibly have hoped for. They do seem calm. They, there's no real aggression towards them. One thing here is once they've finished eating, and they've got nothing else to do but realise there's a new lion in town. Um, there might be a bit of aggression there. And certainly over the next two to three days, we're going to keep a very close eye. Um, from previous experience, it's not necessarily the first day that they pick on each other. It can happen afterwards. But it's definitely a good start. Africa is home to some of the world's most incredible wildlife, but it's a world that's under threat. Even the most iconic predator is in danger. In the wild, numbers of lions are in decline. At Antelope Park in Zimbabwe, the African Lion Rehabilitation and Release into the Wild program is trying to find a solution using human handlers like British conservationist David Yulden to prepare captive bred lions for life in the wild. What I hope we can achieve is we can prove what we believe to be true, and that is that we can take lions and put them back into their natural environment so that they can survive there. And that's gonna allow us to offer those parts of Africa that have lost their lions for various reasons an option of how to bring this incredible animal back into the place where it's supposed to be. 16 years ago, the program's founder, Andrew Connolly, lost his arm when he was injured by a male lion. But the incident only made him more respectful of this fearsome predator. I just cannot imagine Africa without lions. I mean, it's, it's like imagining London without Big Ben. Um, it just, it just, it's just not acceptable. So it's, it's, it's a major project. To me, it's, you know, I don't know how to really explain this. It's like the sun not coming up. If you haven't got, if you haven't got lions in Africa, it's just, just not Africa, is it? Andrew oversees the entire release programme. Today, he's been called in by David because there's another problem with Sango and Swahili. The brother and sister had to be separated because Sango is about to reach sexual maturity. The move went well, but in the days since the split, Swahili has been pining for her brother. She's refused to move from the fence line, and it's a situation that has to change. Today, Swahili and the two other females will be moved to the other side of the reserve. Andrew Connolly will oversee the walk to their permanent new enclosure. He's hoping they all want to go for a walk. These are the three for going out for a walk this morning. These are the three, yeah. It's Swahili, the one in the middle here, that. Uh, we just need to get away from her brother. All the while that she is using him as a source of her confidence, she is not bonding with the females, and that's what we need for her survival in the next stage of the release program. 
With lions of this age, which are coming up on two years old, as much as possible, we'll stay on a vehicle uh, and they'll follow. We might have to be on the ground at, at various points just to uh, usher them along a bit, um, but it's just a lot safer for us if we're on a vehicle. Everyone ready? This is the last time Swahili will ever see her brother. Okay. Come on. Come on. Come, girls. Okay. Come on. The other females already share a close bond, and they immediately start to play. Come on. But Swahili hesitates and begins to head back to Sango. Lions are social animals with strong family ties. Leaving her brother behind is a huge step. Come on! If we spend too much time around here, she's it's just going to go back Ooh. to Sango. Swahili, come on! As the two other females head into the bush, Swahili starts to follow. Here she is. They cover ground quickly, and soon Sango is out of sight. For Swahili, yeah. the instinct to bond with her pride mates is too strong to ignore. So far, so good. Yeah, the, the worry that we had was, would Swahili move away from Sango? Um, she certainly looked a bit tentative. She looked back a few times. Um, but just the sheer joy of being out of the enclosure and back in the natural environment, the time with the, the girl seems to have won over. Um, and that's what we want to develop. We want that bond with the girls just to increase with further opportunities for this. Play tap. They're having such a ball now. This is what we dreamed about years ago when we first started this program. We're seeing lions back in their natural environment like this. And this is what's so exciting and so thrilling and so rewarding. I mean, this is what you're seeing now is really what it's all about. It's, it's really music, you know, I mean, it's, it's wonderful. It's so exciting, it really is. To be part of a successful pride, Swahili, Sahara and Saraya must form a strong bond. Lions are cooperative hunters. To survive, the females must learn to work together. We've got some uh, zebra just at uh, the big dam here. So we're just going to move in that direction. Hopefully the lions will follow. We'll see what happens. David climbs down to encourage the females forward. Come on. That's it. Good girls. Before they can make a kill, the lions must learn how to stalk their prey. Come on, let's go. Reading each other's body language, they have to work as well. Come one. on. With the zebra in their sights, Sahara takes the lead. Let you see what she's doing there, going after the, the rope. The one on the right is flanking. She, the, the line on the right is actually doing a flank. You're seeing a net. They're splitting up now, as you would, literally, as you would in the wild. Sahara and Soraya act as a team. To make a kill, they need Swahili to work with them, but she quickly loses interest. Without her support, the hunt fails. It's been a bit of a long walk for these girls uh, this morning, but it's nearing the end. Uh, just in this tree line here is their new home. Swahili must bond with the other females. If they don't learn to work together, they won't survive. As night falls, David receives some long-awaited news. 
Two adolescent lions have just arrived at the park after an eight-hour journey from one of the program's other sites on the Zambian border. I've just had a radio call to say that uh, Batoka and Babesi, two 18-month-old lions, have just arrived. I'm very excited about seeing them. I haven't seen them since ooh, about four months now. Um, so I'm expecting them to have grown quite considerably. So it's going to be really great to see them. How are you doing? Evening, everyone. Are you feeling strong? David wants to get the lions out of their crates okay, as soon as possible, fine. and he's called in some project side. volunteers to do the heavy lifting. They're not going to be in the best of moods, um, to say the least, and just watch where you put your hands, OK? Obviously, because if they're a bit stressed, there could be claws coming out some of the holes. OK? OK. Cool. Okay. The two lions are 18 months old and are ready to enter the next stage of development, hunting at night. These two lions have both come to Antelope Park because here we're an enclosed reserve, which means that we can give them the freedom to roam around here at night uh, quite safely and they can practice their hunting. That isn't something that's possible at our Victoria Falls project. Okay, open it down. OK, let's just get this open. OK. Let her out. This is Bubasi, right? Yep. David worked with Bubasi and Batoka on, when they girl. were cubs, but they Come haven't on. seen him for months Come and may not remember the bond Hello. they shared. Come, sweetheart. She is right at the back, staring at me. Come on. That's it. Good girl. Good girl. Hello. Just not sure yet, are you? Oh no, dark and scary, huh? Come on. That's it, my girl. Hey, sweetheart. Hey. Nice and cautious. Hello, my sweet. That's it. Good girl. Can someone just come behind and close? And if you can close that behind her. Okay, dope. Right, number two. Okay? Come on, boy. Come on. Hello, my boy. Your sister's over here. Batoka, come on. Hey, Tugs. Ooh, you're even bigger. There we are. Hello, beautiful boy. Cool. Someone please close this gate. And close that gate, please. Cool. There we are. Hello, you two. You're a good-looking boy, eh? They're looking in very good shape. Obviously, a lot larger than I remember. It'll be nice and quiet here overnight, and we'll check in on them in the morning. They'll be absolutely fine. But yeah, I'm very happy to see them again. Right, Douglas, let's go. Tomorrow, David will go in with the lions. To work with them safely, he must reaffirm his place as leader of the Pride. Last night, there were two new arrivals at the Antelope Park Reserve. Come on. Brother and sister, Batoka and Bubesi, had been transferred from one of the project's other sites so they could begin the next part of the programme, night hunting. There we are. Hello, beautiful boy. These two lions have both come back to Antelope Park because here we're an enclosed reserve, which means that we can give them the freedom to roam around here at night uh, quite safely and they can practise their hunting. That isn't something that's possible at our Victoria Falls project. This morning, David and handler McKay and Kube have come to check on the new arrivals. David hasn't worked with the lions for four months, and they may not remember the bond they shared. One thing is they haven't come up to the enclosure fence here to greet us. And what's important for them is they need to feel comfortable with us so that they'll follow us out into the reserve and that's how they're going to get the rest of the experience that they need ready for release. So one of the things we're going to do today is just go in with them and start that bonding process. It shouldn't take too long because obviously they are used to it. They just need to realise that, you know, they can be safe around us. OK, let's go. OK, just take it very gently, eh? Yeah. The lions were hand-reared and for safety, it's important they still see the handlers as dominant members of their pride. 
Hello, you two. Jen, hey now. Hey, Patoka. Hey, Babesi. Gently. Hello. Oh, my lions. Come on, easy. Come on, lions. That's what we Come. want. Hello, little girl. Hello. Come on, little kid. Come. Batoka and Bubesi may look tame, but David and McKay have years of experience, and their ability to read the lion's behavior is the only thing keeping them safe. That's a good sign. The way they greet is just to rub their cheeks up against you. The greeting is a clear indication that the lions still see David as a member of their pride. Hey, come on, come. Some people might think that being here in an enclosure with two large lions is, frankly, a bit insane. The reason why we're able to do this is, from a young age, these lions understand that we are dominant members of their pride. So they've no interest in hurting us. We do discipline them when they're small so they can understand the limits of play behavior with a human, and that's the only training that they get through the whole program. Like all adolescents, Batoka likes to test the boundaries of acceptable behavior. None of come on, that, thank come. you. Right, come OK. On, come on. No. Sometimes when they come up, they'll try and just ankle tap you. Um, there are certain things, behaviors, where we don't allow that. Uh, we give them a discipline, which is done in only one way, which is just a slap come to on, the side man, of the face. Please. It mimics very much what they might get from their mother. That will be front paw slam. Um, and I can tell you when a wild mother does it, there's about a ton of force coming behind it. Me and my little hand, uh, certainly not going to hurt them, but it's just a sign to them that you overstepped the boundary there and immediately he backed off. Ankle tapping is a skill that lions use to trip their prey. The technique is also used during play fights with other lions, but Batoka has to remember that playing rough with the handlers is not acceptable. Move away. Aye. Come on. Come on. Just come. start walking that way. Come. 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 Come on. Come. 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 Come on. Come. 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 There's one more test that David must do before he can be sure that walking with the lions will be safe. Come. Come on. Come on, boy. Come on. Come on. Let's go, Captain. Come on, let's go. So come. This is also good. We're just trying out a bit of following. Come on. They're responding really well. So this is this is a really good start. I don't think it'll be very long before we can take these out. Hey. Yes. Hello, my boy. Later, David checks on Sango's progress. The two-year-old male will soon reach sexual maturity, so he's been separated from his sister, Swahili, and placed with two other males, Echo and Itosha. Hello, boys. Now, Sango, in a wild situation, exactly the same with Echo and Itosha, would have been kicked out of their pride that they were born in and they would have to go it alone. But whilst out in what we call a nomadic phase, it's quite common for young males of different litters to meet up and then join up and become a coalition. So it's quite normal, but the main point here is that all three of them are basically sitting together. There's no injuries, they haven't been fighting, and they seem to be grooming each other as well. This is all good sign that Sango is settling in very well into this new male coalition group. Come on, come. Sango's sister Swahili was moved to the other side of the reserve with two other females, Soraya and Sahara. David wants to see how well the group is bonding, come, 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 come. so he's leading them out on a hunt to see if they can work together. Come, 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 come. The females are two years old. With lions of this age, it's safer for David and the project volunteers to ride in trucks. This is an important walk uh, from our point of view. 
We really want to see how is the dynamic working. Come on. At the moment, we've got Swahili leading. She was always, uh, would always follow Sango before and wouldn't lead. So it's good that, uh, that she's out front at the moment. Uh, she seems quite comfortable. She's walking confidently and the other two are following. They look like a perfectly normal little group of lions here. It's not long before the three females get their first opportunity to hunt as a team. It's quite a large herd of impala just up here on this open flay. It's difficult to tell exactly whether the lions have seen them or not because they're slightly lower down. But hopefully at some point they'll spot a movement and the chase will be on. The Sahara has stalked forward a bit and that looks like Swahili following it. So they might be picking up on the scent even if they can't specifically see them yet. Swahili and Sahara start to stalk forward. But in the middle, Soraya doesn't seem to know what to do. Soraya, to be honest, seems oblivious to the whole thing. There's absolutely no accounting for what lions will do. Sahara has clearly seen the impala. Swahili has got it going on. Soraya, on the other hand, is going exactly in the opposite direction. It's all a learning process. Okay, now she's got it. But she's interested. Sahara jumped off to the right, obviously flanking. The other two held their position but Sahara does seem to have lost interest. What I have seen before is where a herd runs away in lots of different directions, as this impala herd has just done, it quite often confuses a young lion and they really just don't know which way to go. So I think she might have given up, but they are still slowly heading in the direction of the herd. So we'll try and follow them. Okay, do you want to move forward? David's desperate to see effective cooperation between the lionesses. It's their best chance of a kill. Cubs have seen a giraffe. Sahara is leading up front. And now the other two are also following. Frankly, I think that meal is just a little bit too big for them, but it's not unheard of. We've had a 13-month-old lion kill a giraffe before. She's getting into the long grass now. That's going to give her cover. A big male giraffe, not a chance. But again, the thing there is she started stalking, okay, and it's the practice. She'll understand that she has to stalk a little bit better, take advantage of the longer grass, and she'll learn for next time when she's approaching something a bit more manageable size. Lions can only charge at top speed for around 30 metres. Stalking skills are vital to get close enough to prey. There's more giraffe just in this open area in front of us. See how it looks like. Swahili's taken a far right flank. Sahara is coming up on the left. Now it looks like Soraya is headed in the same direction Swahili has. This time, the three really cooperate using a typical pride tactic. One lion makes a charge, forcing the prey towards others hidden in the grass. Head towards the two giraffe on the right. Ooh, hold on. <coughs> Although it doesn't pay off this time, 
It's a significant development. Just move forward through that way slowly. I think the other two will be in there. And now it's getting darker. You can all immediately see a difference in their behavior. I don't know how best to describe it, except they seem to be walking in a much more determined way. As the light fades, lions gain confidence and energy for the hunt. Their night vision is thought to be seven times better than humans, and they do most hunting at dusk and dawn. Now, in a moment, I'm going to turn on a spotlight that we have. Uh, it's a, it has a red filter on, um, which will reduce the impact that we have on what's going on around us and their natural behavior. Come, girls. Come on. That's it. Good girls. The three lions are keeping together. They're working as a unit here, and that's really what we wanted to see tonight. Um, Swahili is still leading. Quite a determined little thing, isn't she? Sangha is long forgotten, I'm afraid, and I do think there's possibly an animal coming up on the right-hand side. There is. Just up ahead of us in the long grass is either a diker or a steambok, which is a small antelope, only maybe two feet at most in height. Uh, so we're just going to stop back. The lions hopefully will move in that direction and they'll see it. The problem for the lions to overcome here is that the diker's normal response in fear is to run a short distance and then duck down and sit in the grass very quietly and therefore difficult to find. The lioness's sense of smell is weaker than their sight and hearing. If it stays completely still, the little antelope may escape detection. How did she miss it? I think it's sitting down with its eyes closed. <laughs> it's around here somewhere. It's steam bucket canny. Kids, you were so close. <laughs> They're ready to go home. It's time to call it a night. Come on, Zaid, come. Come on, jump, come, 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 come. Come on. We had a couple of good chases this evening and a few near misses, and yeah, I'm a little disappointed that they didn't manage to get anything, but the important thing is Swahili seems to be very well integrated into this group of three, and surprisingly for us, she led pretty much the whole way and looks good doing it. The Antelope Park Reserve in Zimbabwe forms part of the African Lion Rehabilitation and Release into the Wild program, a controversial project trying to tackle the problem of declining lion populations. Here, captive bred lions develop the skills they need to survive under the guidance of human handlers led by David Yulden. Thank you. 18 month old brother and sister, Batoka and Bubesi, have recently arrived at the reserve from one of the program's other sites on the Zambian border. Well, let's see if we can head that way and see how good these things are at hunting. David hasn't walked with the lions for four months, but he's assessed their behavior to make sure they still see him as a dominant member of their pride. Taking every precaution, he's called in his most experienced handlers. As walks go, this is about as difficult for us as it gets. Uh, obviously, they are quite large and they don't know us that well. Um, so how they're going to react is something new to us. We're going to have to learn very quickly. So I brought quite a few of my colleagues here today. Um, just by having sheer numbers of people on the walk, um, they'll feel a little bit unnerved by that. Um, and therefore, actually, as a result of that, they should calm down a bit. Is everyone feeling OK? Are you confident? Cool. Just normal rules. Just if we can try and stay as a group. OK. Let's go. Come on. Come on, hello. Come on. Come on. Hey, Tox. Come on. That's it. And she's off. Okay, do you want to round them up? The lion handlers will have to run round behind them um, and just make a bit of noise to try and usher them back to the group. As adolescents, 
Batoka and Bubesi have already developed a strong independent streak. This way, come on. <laughs> come, you two. Don't know where they're going, but they are determined with it. Come on, come. Toka. Come, Batoka, come. Warthog kids. Just sitting in these first few hundred metres of the walk, we can already see these lions have their own agenda entirely. And that's fine to a point, but what we need to do every so often is just walk away, call them and see if they follow. On this occasion, after a moment's hesitation, they have changed direction. So that's what we need to keep going. Come on. It's not long before lion manager, Leanne Marnock, spies an opportunity for Batoka and Bubesi. Um, when we were heading across here, we saw some war dogs run away and we've just come across some dung. Batoka picked up the scent. You can see he was sniffing it just now, so hopefully we'll find where they've gone. Come on, boys, come. Come on. Come on, let's go, come. After a while, Batoka picks up warthog scent again. And this time, he's close enough to charge. Close. She's still going. Okay, she's on now. Bubesi joins in the chase. <laughs> Very exciting stuff. Kicked straight in with the hunting instinct for Batoka. He charged off to the left. But Bessie went off to the right. Very, very close chase. This is a great walk. This must be where the warthogs are living. If he's prepared to put that amount of effort in this amount of heat, I think that he's going to be very, very good at hunting at night. Come on. Hello. After the near miss, the handlers start to lead Batoka and Babesi back to their enclosure. No one is prepared for what happens next. Out of the blue, Batoka brings Leanne to the ground. David and the handlers respond immediately, but Leanne suffers a bite wound to her thigh. Some days later, David spends time with Batoka and Bubesi to take stock. Leanne is, is perfectly fine, and actually just speaking to her yesterday, she really can't wait to come back um, and just get back to work again. We do accept that when working with wild animals, there is always a risk um, that you could get injured. But certainly speaking to, for myself, um, I accept risks every day just in you know, the normal day-to-day -day activities. Um, and it's my opinion that the risk of walking lions is certainly no higher than many of the other things that I do um, without even thinking of it. Incidents like this are extremely rare, but from now on, the handlers will only work with Batoka and Bubesi from the safety of a vehicle. It minimizes risk while guaranteeing the lion's future. It's everyone's opinion, including the Anne's, that these lions must continue within the program. We'll just need to consider how we work with them over the coming weeks so that these lions that we've all invested so much time and, and effort into do get the full benefit of the release program. At Antelope Park in Zimbabwe, David Yulden and a team of experienced handlers help captive bred lions learn about life in the wild. You can see them from there, surely. There we go. Uh, there we are, you see them. By the time they're three years old, the lions can hunt successfully. But for the release program to be a success, they must also be placed into groups to form prides. Today, David and lion manager Leanne Marnock are overseeing a potentially dangerous first step in that process, introducing a male lion into a female group. This is Luke. He's quite an aggressive lion, and part of that might be 
because he's on his own. And at his age, in a wild area, he would be tech trying to take over his own pride. So it's just a, a more natural social group for him. Introductions between males and females always carry risks. But in this one, the stakes are unusually high. Two years ago, Luke was part of a release pride until two of its females were killed. What happened isn't clear, but it's possible Luke was involved. And since then, he's lived alone. Today, he's getting a second chance. In the enclosure next door are three females, Azulu, Nadia and Alice. They've lived together for three years. In the wild, their group would be led by an alpha male. Here, that role will fall to Luke. Come on, Jeff. But first, the team must persuade the lionesses to leave their enclosure. Right, we've got Izulu. Izulu is first to cooperate. <laughs> come on, come. Come on, Nadia. Come. At the moment, we're just trying to bring them into the, this management corridor here uh, and then down to the end. That leads into the enclosure where they're going to get introduced to Luke. Um, but lions are quite lazy, so this must might take a little while. Alice, come on. Good girl. Alice soon follows. But Nadia, the most stubborn female, refuses to come down from her tree. Come on, Gilly, come. Come on. She doesn't even look comfortable. Come on. Lions actually climb trees an awful lot. Um, it gets very, very hot down at ground level and they can get just a bit of breeze up there. Also, they're just slightly fewer flies. You see, you're not really that comfortable, are you? For the introduction to be a success, it's vital that the three females go in with Luke at the same time. If Nadia doesn't come down from the tree, the introduction will have to be delayed. <laughs> After more than an hour of coaxing, Leanne decides on a different tactic. These girls love water. Hopefully it'll just scare her and it won't bother her at all. The water is sprayed just in front of Nadia's nose and it's enough of a nuisance to persuade her to come down. Come Nadia, come on. Come on, come on. Come on. Yay, done. Right, final step is to let them into the enclosure they're actually going to live in, and then we'll get Luke. Luke was three when he lived with the other females, and his inexperience could have led to the confrontation in which they were killed. Now, 12 months on, David hopes Luke has matured enough to cope with his new role. But no one knows how he'll react when he comes face to face with the three lionesses. With Luke locked in a temporary enclosure, the three females immediately start to explore. Azulu is the first to mark her new territory. She uses scent glands in her cheeks to stake her claim over Luke's favorite tree. And just to be sure he gets the message, she sprays it with her urine. Luke's frustration builds as the three females quickly make themselves at home. Lions are unpredictable, so we can't really tell from this point how he's going to react with the females. But we just have to wait and see. Hopefully it'll go well. We're keeping our fingers crossed. In the wild, when a new male enters a pride, he'll challenge the females and force them to submit to his rule. To be a successful leader, Luke will need to establish dominance over the three females. If Azulu, Alice and Nadia don't submit, he could attack them. Bongani, uh, please can you open Luke's gate? Luke enters the enclosure and quickly has Azulu in his sights. She submits by cowering to the ground and rolling on her back. But when Luke ignores her, she changes tack.
When Azulu finally concedes defeat, Luke roars to make his superior status known. Reaffirming his dominance by reclaiming his favorite tree. On the other side of the enclosure, Luke spots Alice. She's the oldest female in the group and the most aggressive. But faced with the threat of Luke, she quickly backs down. Next, it's Nadia's turn. Baring her teeth, she warns Luke to keep his distance. But he stands his ground, and she submits. It's a huge relief for David. It always looks a bit more violent uh, than it actually is with lions, but it went exactly as we'd hoped for. He postured in front of them, they showed full submission, uh, yeah, there's always going to be a little swipe from either side, but they've all settled down now, and I think this has gone e exactly how we would have wanted. The whole point of the females being in here with Luke is for us to see if he's going to be okay with females in the future. So this is basically a test for him to see if he's going to react to the females in a good way. Over the next few days, there'll be a few more fights, but it means that if he can live stably with a group of females, we can now consider him for release again. Good lad. The reserve regularly plays host to paying volunteers who come on working holidays. <laughs> they provide crucial funding, as well as helping hands for the conservation program. All the volunteers get the opportunity to walk with the lions, but they're also expected to get their hands dirty. Today, a small group of them are working with guide Roy Steffen on one of the least pleasant tasks. The reserve receives cattle carcasses from local farms and meat from abattoirs that's not fit for human consumption. But not everything that's donated is fit for the lions to eat either. What we do is um, the meat that's not suitable, um, because we don't believe in wasting, what we're going to do is um, we're going to take it to some of the other residents of Antelope Park and uh, hopefully they'll appreciate it a little bit more. Okay, so we need to get this lovely barrel into the back of our vehicle. Uh, I can't <laughs> I actually get over to you how disgusting it smells. It's, yeah. it's, it smells what you'd imagine death to smell like, which I guess was what it is. Yeah. And intestines and... Uh, Not yeah. good. No. All good. It may be repulsive to human senses, but the rotting meat and offal represent a banquet for one of Africa's most iconic scavengers. The team head for an area of the park where they know their stinking truckload of meat will be appreciated. OK, let's offload this stuff. <laughs> OK, guys, um, if we spread the offal out a bit, sort of out here. This goes against every sense of my body being anywhere near this. <laughs> Especially on a hot day like this. <laughs> right, look at this. Roy has the benefit of experience and stays upwind. <sighs> Nothing. But volunteer James McCoy isn't so wise. <laughs> I've never felt anything like that. <coughs> that is rank. <laughs> I'm so glad we have volunteers here to do this. Yeah, and I'm buzzing that I'd pay to do this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. OK, guys, right. let's load up. Load up. The volunteers escape the smell, but it won't be long before the stench of rotting flesh attracts hundreds of hungry mouths. The skies over the Antelope Park Reserve in Zimbabwe are filling with one of Africa's most infamous scavengers, vultures. 
rotten meat unfit for the reserve's captive bred lions has been placed in the bush by a team of project volunteers, ensuring nothing goes to waste. David Yulden and his colleagues have dubbed this area of the reserve Vulture's Restaurant. The Vulture's Restaurant here is vitally important to the vulture population in this region. Most of the land around us has been converted into agriculture and livestock farming. There's also very few predators around, so there really limits the number of kill sites and therefore available meat for these birds. So by providing food here for them, we're actually supporting a vulture population from a vast area around Antelope Park. And I've been up here before and seen over 350 birds supporting six different vulture species. That's very, very rare within Zimbabwe. The dominant species today is the white-backed vulture, but they don't have it all their own way. See the smaller black and white birds? Those are pied crows. They actually give the vultures quite a hard time by pecking at them, trying to get them out of the way. It's a bit of a scramble and the meat's not going to last long. It's eat as quickly as you can and then get out of here. Vultures have very strong acid in their digestive tracts, enabling them to thrive on decaying meat that would make most animals ill. The pied crows and white-backed vultures soon get company. That is a lappet-faced. They're really cool. The lappet-faced vulture surveys the scene from the safety of a tree before descending for his share. Here he comes, here he comes. The white-backed vultures are a lot smaller and their beaks aren't nearly as strong as the lappet-faced. So if we put a carcass out, the white-backs usually just have to sit around and wait for the lappet to arrive, break it open, and only then will they get a chance to feed for themselves. But he's so much bigger, and particularly if they come in numbers, they pretty much control the feeding time. Today, because it's small chunks of meat, everyone's getting a share. Within an hour, the birds have devoured the lot. There's still a few vultures and some yellow-billed kites circling around, but by the looks of it, everything that we gave them is gone. The entire mound of offal is no more, and all of that meat, now just a few bones left. The flies complete the cleanup. That, that's quite remarkable that it, it, they eat it that quickly. The whole lot is gone. There's got to be some very fat vultures around here. In the wild, the African lion is under threat. David and the team at Antelope Park are doing everything they can to try and find a solution. Some experts believe that numbers have dropped by as much as 80% within the last 50 years. Conflicts with humans and livestock, loss of habitat and hunting are all thought to be responsible. And disease is a factor too. At the reserve, a group of lions has been sedated as part of ongoing research into one particular condition, FIV, the big cat equivalent of HIV. The research is led by wildlife disease specialist, Dr. Peter Catt. One of the unique opportunities we have here at Antelope Park is that there are positive lions and there are negative lions. So what we can do is we can compare the positive lions and the negative lions over a period of about three to four years and document exactly what the effects of infection are and thereby help the positive lions in um, the wild. I think there's some initial indications here, you see. Little is known about the effects of FIV because it's hard to gather information on wild lions. But over two days, Peter and a large team, including some of the project volunteers, are examining and taking blood from 18 of the reserve's lions, nine that have the condition and nine that don't. Once each lion has been anaesthetized, it's kept cool with water and oxygen levels are carefully monitored. 
Pulse Ox 62 and 42. Yeah. It's a lot of wear for a young lion. Here, there's there's a little bit of bleeding around the bottom of our tooth. Yeah. You can see that little pink area right there? Yeah. It would have been her who almost certainly would have got it first. One of the early indications of this um, FIV in the lions is that they you get this manifestation of gingivitis um, around the teeth, and it'll get worse over time, but she's already starting to get this sort of pinkness around the, the, uh, the top of the teeth, and she's losing pigmentation in her mouth. So it's an early indication that um, the FIV virus is starting to act on her. Because information about the effects of FIV is limited, it's not known how quickly infected lions will develop more serious health problems, if at all. Peter and David hope that in the years ahead, this research will provide answers. The last stage for these is just to get their uh, reversal. Um, so we'll put that in in just a moment and they should be awake again in three or four minutes. Okay, IV and IM. Okay, let's go. Observers, please make sure you're in a good position to watch your lion. The lions are disorientated when they come round. Designated volunteers monitor them closely as they find their feet. After a wobbly start, the recovery goes well. And there's every chance these captive bred lions have helped their cousins in the wild. What we're hoping from this research is that we'll have a greater understanding of how this virus affects lions. That hopefully will be able to give us a chance to make better informed decisions about wild lions in the future. When the heat of the day fades, it's a cue for Africa's wildlife to become more active. For David, it's a busy time too. Six-month-old captive-bred cubs Jabari and Jelani are learning about life in the wild. As adults, they'll need to hunt prey at waterholes, so today, David is introducing them to water. Jabari has always been the more confident cub, and he doesn't need much encouragement. But his brother Jelani is more hesitant. Jelani here is the one that's uh, just tentatively patting the top of the water. Actually, when they're younger cubs, they can't differentiate water from land, um, and a few small ones will just run out across it as if it's land and then sink. Um, but he's doing a gentle tap tap. Yeah, he just seems not keen at all. Some lions absolutely love water. Others never go near it. Tomorrow, the cubs will leave Antelope Park and go to one of the conservation program's other sites in Zimbabwe. David won't see them for a while, but he's delighted with their progress. I mean, just even in the last week, they're making huge strides. Uh, just this constant interaction with their environment, the fact that they feel safe because they're uh, with us. Um, they're just developing day by day. They're exploring new things. Um, and all of that is the, is the real point of what we're doing. It will soon be time to say farewell. And David is reluctant. It's always difficult when you have to say goodbye to a set of cubs because you've worked with them. You've got to understood the individual character of the cubs. Um, and you've seen them develop and make progress in the, in the program. To then not see them for a while, it's really difficult because you just constantly want to know, you know what's happened next in their life. You want to be part of it. But at the end of the day, I know they're going to get all of the experiences that they need for their progress. So unfortunately, I'm just going to have to bite the bullet on this one and, and say goodbye and then just catch in with them later. Come on. Come on. Come on, boys. That's it. Good lad. Come on, little ones. Who's coming? Who's coming?
African Lion Rehabilitation and Release into the Wild program is just one of the projects working to help save Africa's most iconic predator. Hello, little ones. Oh, there we go. David Yulden has worked with the program for five years. How are you? In simple terms, what we're trying to achieve is to release lions back into the wild. But that's not easily done. You can't just take a captive bred lion and put it into the wild. So there need to be intermediate steps in the program. The lions develop the skills they need under the watchful eye of human handlers. The long-term aim is for the lions to go into prides and survive on their own. Two years ago, David and the team got one step closer to achieving that dream. of August 2007. It's release day for a pride of adults. Two males and five females are about to be moved into a 500 acre site. Much is riding on this release. It's a first for the program and a measure of things to come. It's a major thing and knowing that the site is now ready that in just a couple of hours time there's going to be lions roaming around in there. It really is. It's like a I feel like a kid on Christmas Day. Oh my God. David's excitement is short-lived. She's had a bit of a beating. His favorite lion has been injured. Oh, Fire, come, come up. Two-year-old Fire was the first lion David reared from birth. Oh, you had a hard time, didn't you? She's been hurt in a fight with the lead male, Maxwell, as he tried to assert his leadership over the pride. When we put the group together, one thing that the males will do is go around each of the females, give them a fat slap just so you can place his uh, dominance over them. And fire was always gonna be the one that wasn't necessarily gonna you know, take to that very well. Uh, so she's sustained a few injuries. You got beaten up, didn't you, girl? Thankfully, fire's wounds aren't as bad as they look and the park vets confirm the release can go ahead. The project staff and volunteers gather to witness the moment of truth. Come on, come on, beautiful girl. Okay? It's gonna be okay. Hey, sweetie. I'm nervous, I'm excited. I, I just, I can't wait to get the gate open. And these are the keys. The lions are radio collared so that the team can track them after the release. See you next time. Go on, go. Go on, boy. David has no way of knowing how fire will settle in the pride. From now on, it's down to her. Yeah, fire's my little kitty. It's from the moment I picked her up uh, when she was this big to see her out here and um, you know where she's supposed to be she can go out and live the life that you know she was born to be three days later and there's worrying news Maxwell, the lead male, has been seen covered in blood. David is worried there's been another fight with fire. We're going to get on, we're going to head down to the release site, we're going to see what's going on, and we're going to see if we can find fire. The team rush to the site hey. and find hey. fire alive, but caked in blood. It's obvious there's some great news. The pride has made its first kill an eland, Africa's biggest antelope. But the situation is hard to read. What we need to try and work out is whether she's had a fight with Maxwell at some point overnight, and that's injuries, or has she already been at the kill? And that's blood from that. Either way, she's sitting away from the rest of the group at the moment. Fire's just gone straight past us, and I can't see any new injuries. She is covered in blood at the front. At this point, I'm pretty sure 
that she was there right at the moment of the kill and has already started eating. But we still have that worry that fire seems to be having an issue from a social point of view. A wild lioness, rejected by her own pride, has little chance of being accepted by another, and surviving alone is hard. Fire is sitting off to one side. She's keeping a very, very keen eye on what's going on. And I'd expect once Maxwell's had his fill, she'll get her chance to come back in. Having established that fire isn't hurt, David can reflect on the bigger picture. The key thing here is they've made a kill. It's the morning of day three. We knew that if we gave them the right experience to allow them to practice their hunting when they're a bit younger, they would be prepared and ready to start hunting in this release site pretty much straight away. It's actually happened maybe a day or two earlier than we thought it might, but our program is working. This is it. This is how it is supposed to be happening. So now she's just, she's been keeping an eye on the situation. But she's now creeping slowly forward, and hopefully she'll have the confidence to come back to the kill and start eating again. We've got really close now. You can see Maxwell's keeping a close eye on her. There's a bit of growling. And now the whole ride's together. Sadly, the pride's success was not to last. A year after the release, the political and economic upheaval in Zimbabwe forced the team to bring the lions back to the safety of Antelope Park. Hello, fire. Hello. Closing the release site was a huge blow. Hello, my girl. Hello, sweetheart but land for a new site has already been found, and David is confident that fire will have a promising future. You know, she's a resourceful young lion, and she really has found her place in this pride. And this pride here really is the future for the program. It's their cubs that are gonna be our first lions released back into the wild in stage four of this program. So it's only a matter of time now before I guess I get to be a granddad and watch the cub that I raised from a young'un bring out her little ones and start teaching them. This is the last time David will see fire for a while because today he's leaving Antelope Park and heading to one of the project's other sites in Zambia. It is a long way and it's going to be hot, and, but you know, that's Africa. It's beautiful, beautiful on the way. David Yulden works on the African Lion Rehabilitation and Release into the Wild program. The project has two sites in Zimbabwe and a third in Zambia, David's destination after a 300-mile journey. The site in Zambia is in the Mozi Oatunya National Park, which lies along the banks of the Zambezi River near Victoria Falls. An extraordinary variety of wildlife lives here, including elephant, white rhino and hippo. But the only lions here are captive bred and part of the conservation project. David and his colleagues help them develop the skills they need to survive in the hope that one day their cubs can be released into the wild. David's first stop is with manager Nicola Leach. Hey, how are you doing? Hello. Are you all right? How are you? I'm very well. How was your trip? Um, 
loads happening. So uh, after a month away in Zimbabwe, David's keen to catch up on what's been happening in Zambia. I think that's been good here. Fantastic. The lions got very close to a giraffe, which is very cool. They're, okay, they're, they're due. They're absolutely due for a kill. So cool. That's exciting. Yeah. Having heard the latest developments, David rushes to see the lions. Hello. Hey, little ones. This is actually one very large enclosure that's split into three, and we've got a total of eight lions in here. Good girl. Until now, the programme has always raised lions in sibling groups, only putting them into prides when they're two years old. The lions in Zambia are the first to be raised together from a very young age. By living as a pride, this group is able to deal with all of those social issues that happen in any group. Who gets on with who, who doesn't like who, who's going to steal your meat. All of that stuff can be dealt with and out of the way before they have to move into stage two, when they're going to have to concentrate much more on how to survive. It's too early to say how this approach will work out, and for now, David's just happy with the warm welcome. They've all come running over to say hi. Uh, it's nice to know that I haven't been forgotten. Um, so I'm quite excited to get walking. Good night, kids. See you in the morning. Early next morning, David gets his first chance to walk with some of the Zambian lions. He's hoping to find prey for them so they can practice their hunting skills. Confirm, have you found any prey species up there? Impala particularly? Oh, just so. He's walking with brother and sister Toka and Leia and 18-month-old Zulu. Now, there are three very, very different lions in this group. Toka is extremely lazy, very affectionate, and really, what you see is what you get. Hey, Zulu. Zulu is an adolescent male. His mane is still growing, and his immature Mohican makes him stand out from the crowd. Zulu may have a warrior's name, but he doesn't always live up to it. When we first started w trying to walk with him, he would literally just hide in a corner, and literally everything would scare him. Grass swaying in the breeze was enough to, like, have him just hunker down, close his eyes, just absolutely petrified. And it's taken many, many months to get him just to the point that he'll actually leave the enclosure. Leia, on the other hand, goes off, does her own thing, um, and we're particularly impressed with her because at 13 months old, she managed to pull down and kill a giraffe single-handedly. That's a supreme hunter over there. Oi, lump. Go on. <laughs> what are you sitting down for? Leia, come. Zulu, come on. Top balls. Hey. Get out of it. The thing with these three is they don't walk together, so they're always just that. <laughs> they're all over the place. They walk around in circles. They, yeah, it's... You really have to keep your eyes in every direction at once. Come on. Try and stick together, would you? Toka, get up. Come on. Toka alternates between laziness. What? <laughs> you can't just greet all the time. And affection. God. His sister Leia has strong predatory instincts. In the wild, lionesses do most of the hunting. David's not surprised that Leia is the only one focused on finding prey. Leia found some impala, and actually they're still ahead of us, so she's gone into full stalk mode. So the impala's run off, but she's still interested, so maybe it didn't go far. Decent first stalk, but... Being young and inexperienced, she gave her location away. The dense scrub provides good cover for the lions and enables them to get close to prey without needing to stalk over long distances. 
actually lions have a higher hunting success rate if they don't stalk. If they, upon stumbling on an animal, they immediately chase it, their success rate goes up significantly. Unfortunately, I can't teach that to Leia. The two boys, on the other hand, um, well, Zulu went in the opposite direction and Tokka is just wandering along, completely oblivious. But Leia's still on the case. Come on. Come on. <laughs> oh dear, Tokka. Tokka has decided to sit down, which is not much you can do other than pleading with him, and that doesn't really work. But uh, it might actually be easier just to pick him up and carry him, to be honest. He is unbelievable. Come on. Leia's not deterred by her brother's lazy attitude. She remains intent on stalking. This is Impala. Zulu follows her lead. And even Toka gets involved. The boys break cover too early. They charge from a distance and startle the Impala, leaving Leia with an impossible task. Talk is that enough. <laughs> the boys are useless. Leia, come. David leads the lions to water. It's time for Leia to relax. You tired, kids? But even at play, her character and potential captivate David. Leia is going to be a fantastic addition to this release pride because she's absolutely fearless when it comes to hunting. Uh, she's even jumped on a hippo, which has never happened in this program before. Yeah, she has a lot to learn yet, but she really is incredible. One of the essential skills the program lions must develop is how to hunt at night. And the arrival of a lorry from South Africa takes them one step closer. It's carrying essential supplies to build a secure enclosure, especially for night hunts. We're going to need side cutters and pliers. Tubby Hardman is the fencing contractor. He'll oversee the construction in Zambia's Dambwa Forest. When all the ropes are ready, we'll start there on top. Tubby's working to a deadline. We're trying to have this job finished before Christmas, so every, every day now is a problem, especially with the rain coming. Guys, this is heavy. Guys, it's heavy. The thousand acre enclosure will allow the lions to practice their night hunting skills without affecting the safety of people in the area. Long term, it will be suitable for the release of lion prides too. It's the culmination of five years' work. I'm almost lost for words just to talk about today because when I first arrived at the programme in 2004 is when we first applied for the permits to put a release site here in the Danwa Forest. And now, here it is. Gents, we'll have to come this side, please. Tubby and his team have a huge job ahead of them, but once the enclosure's complete, it'll play a crucial role in the lion's progress. A few days later, David is checking on the fence build when he gets some exciting news. He rushes to join the handlers who are walking Zulu, Toka and Leia. I've just had a phone call to say that Leia has killed a giraffe, which will be the second time that she's done this. She's 17 months old now, and the last one she did single-handedly when she was 13 months old. The kill is David's confirmation that Leia is ready to move on to the night hunting phase of the program, and she'll be one of the first to use the new night hunting enclosure. But above all, it's a huge step on her pride's journey to independence. Many people will tell you this is impossible. Well, there it is, right in front of us. Captive Red Lion has been able to stalk and bring down a young giraffe. 
One of the really important parts of this program is that the lions have the skill to hunt animals of a size large enough to feed a pride without our input at all. They is going to do that for us, no problem at all. Toka and Zulu, I'm told by the people here that saw it, did nothing at all to assist in this particular hunt. But as is typical for males in lion prides, they're going to get their fair share before she gets hers. So she's done all the work, they're going to get the spoils. But that's certainly big enough that she'll be pretty fat by the end of the night. So yeah, sorry for the giraffe, but from the program point of view, it doesn't get better than this. southern Zambia lies the Mozi Oatunya National Park. The 16,000 acre reserve offers a safe refuge for Africa's wildlife and is also home to 10 captive bred lions come, come, come. raised by human handlers including David Yulden. Good girl. David came to Africa five years ago and since that time, he's dedicated his life to working with lions. The Zambian lions are ready to enter the next stage of development, hunting at night. Work has already begun on a huge perimeter fence, securing a thousand acres of prime habitat where the lions will be able to hunt for themselves. It feels so close now. Just in maybe two to three months, Kila and Kwandi and the others are going to be in this area and we're going to be able to watch them hunting. I mean, that it's so exciting. I, I don't even know quite how to, how to phrase it, but it just feels so close now. As the project moves forward, the first posts have already been laid. Fence contractor Tubby Hardman is driving the build forward. The first step is to create three holding enclosures. We've managed to get all the poles into the management pens. Um, at present, we've just finished the drop gate. This will be one of the handling pens within a management pen. And we will then start putting in the concrete apron uh, to prevent the uh, lines digging out under there. Yeah. The project also provides much needed work for local people. Working conditions out here are very tough. Um, the men that are working here are coming 8Ks in the morning through elephant uh, country, so they walk as a group. Uh, to protect themselves and they walk back 8 k's at night. So can you imagine uh, 16 k's in a day to get uh, into work and out of work? Very tough um, kitchen, is the uh, chef cooks for the team just under a tree and as we move along, so if we 4 k's away from here, we just move the kitchen along and we cart all the water in buckets and tanks. About four days time we will start putting the wire up now. Everything, all the main posts are already set in concrete and they're drying at this very moment. So I would say in seven to ten days' time we'll have this job just about buttoned up. Is it all right on top, Adam? Yeah. Okay. The youngest lions in the Zambian program are 12-month-old sisters Temi and Swana. David hasn't walked out with them for four weeks as he's been working at the project's other site in Zimbabwe. Come on, then. But despite the time apart, the youngsters greet him like one of their own. Hello. Hello. Gently. Gently. Way too excited. Are you ready? Are you calm now? Let's go. Come on. Working with lions of this age is not without risk. Watch your back. They're likely to test me on this walk simply because they haven't seen me in a while. You see, you just come in too fast. Look at you with your... Yeah, For you safety, go. David must re-establish his role Here as leader of the pride. There you go. This is Temi. Uh, she's quite obvious because she's, oh, she's very, very pale uh, underneath. And Swana here, her sister, is just a little bit darker. At just over one year old, they're actually looking a bit tall and lanky, but that's completely normal. 
around about this age, they actually have a huge growth spurt. Much like adolescents, get a lot of height, but not much width. So, <laughs> yes, I know. Uh, one thing is, these lions haven't seen me in a month. And with people that they recognize but haven't seen for a while, they quite often just test you a bit. Um, but an important thing for me is just to reassert my dominance. Um, and that can be as simple as rubbing the front of the head, which they don't particularly like, um, but here we go. Um, but it's okay for me to do it because they know that they can't kind of bite me or anything because then they'll get disciplined. But yeah, adolescence, a little on the naughty side. Hopefully they'll behave themselves, although Timmy here doesn't give me any signal that she's likely to. Come on! <laughs> they have been showing fantastic skill at hunting. Um, they work incredibly well as a team, but <laughs> at this age, they're very, very playful. Um, and quite often, they just can't get the concentration together to follow through with a, a successful hunt. So a lot of animals get away, but these two really are two to watch. To help the sisters gain the experience they need, David and the handlers lead them on daily excursions come, through the come, bush. Come, come, come. Come, my girls. Giving them the chance Maybe to come face to come. face with prey is the best way Temi and Swana can develop their hunting skills, and the sisters don't have to wait long for an opportunity to impress. David catches a glimpse of a small antelope. There is a diker here somewhere though. There was a diker sleeping under the tree. In the thick bush, he loses it. But Swana is tracking its location and she's already closing in. Diker tries to run. But Temi and Swana give chase. I don't understand what the noise is. Have they lost it? Swana did an absolutely textbook stalk, real low to the ground, and what turned out to be a baby diker. But just from experience, diker make a very unpleasant crying sound when caught, and usually when a lion catches a diker for the first time, just this noise surprises them. They tend to let go. That's what Swana's done here. Hello. Um, and the thing got away. But I can guarantee you, they never make the same mistake twice. Good girls. The diker has escaped for now. But it won't have gone far. Its instincts tell it to stay out of sight. But its constant distress call leads Swana straight to its hiding place. She's on it. This time, the sisters don't make the same mistake. The Stiker made the fatal error of, rather than just hiding, it cried out. So the lions have picked up the scent again. And I have to say, it's very, very difficult to watch something like this. This is a young animal and these lions are learning. So it's not pleasant to watch. From our point of view, this is exactly the experience that these lions need. Richard. Hey, Dad. 
Just be advised that Swana has just made her first kill, one juvenile diker. Copy that, thank you. Swana has made her first kill. She's 13 months old. It's a young, very young, diker. It's great for her progress in the program. For David, the moment is bittersweet. There's a word for this kind of two emotions at the same time. One is I'm um, ecstatic that one of our lions has made her first kill. She's on the road to a successful release into the next part of the program. But watching a life end, particularly in not overly pleasant means, which is you know the, the norm for lions, is very very difficult to watch. So mixed emotions. What I have to take away as the sun goes down on us this evening, our program has moved another step forward and that's what it's about. In Zambia, British conservationist David Yulden is working with captive bred lions as part of a radical and potentially dangerous conservation program. I get up at about 4.30 every morning just because I can't wait for the day to start. The people I've worked with are so dedicated to this program that it just doesn't seem to matter what obstacle is put in front, what challenge is there, you know, you find a way and you see these lions doing better and better in the program. Here, seven of the lions live as one pride. In just 12 months time, they'll be moved to a release site deep in the heart of the Dambwa forest. Three management pens are already under construction and the perimeter fence is beginning to take shape. Adam Tiabanalo, is an experienced tradesman and he's traveled from South Africa to pass on his skills to the local workforce. We started when we put the concrete, throwing the concrete, teaching them how to throw concrete. From there we teach them how to tie wires, but they are learning they are right now. Yes. We wish maybe they can do this themselves in future. This project will help these people a lot. The forest habitat offers nearly everything the lions need. But in the barren African landscape, there's a crucial element that's in short supply. The project's founder, Andrew Connolly, and project manager, Richard Leach, have been searching for the vital ingredient. Beautiful sweet water. You know, you can get a saline sometimes. So this is nice sweet water, it's great. The importance of any project that you're doing out in Africa in the bush is to find water. If it's for humans, or if it's for the wildlife, or it's for the lions, you can't do anything until you've got water. And it's not always that easy to find, actually. Um, and we've been divining and looking around this area just for a few days. And the first hole we dug, we've got about 11,000 meters now. Water is actually step one of many steps to come. No water, no project, simple as that. And we've got great water here. The race is on to finish the site. Every day, the Zambian lions get one step closer to release. For the release program to be a success, Come, my girls. the pride Come on. must Come. hunt for themselves. In the wild, that responsibility often falls yep. to the older females. This is going to be one of those short, fast walks. Come on! At the heart of the release pride are three successful lionesses. Keela is the alpha female. Her sister, Kwundi, is a natural-born hunter. And 16-month-old Loma has strong predatory instincts. Together, they form a formidable team. The national park is the perfect hunting ground. Come on! Come. With an abundance of prey. Kwundi, come on! On the hunt, the females cover ground quickly, 
and soon spot movement ahead. It's a buffalo. 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 Just in this train. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Buffalo. found a buffalo. Um, it looks like it's one single animal, and at the moment they're trying to surround it. Weighing over 800 kilograms, the lone buffalo is three times heavier than a single lion. To stand any chance of taking it down, the lionesses must work together. Obviously, such a big animal is going to keep charging back to the lions, and if the buffalo catches one of the lions, it it really could actually hurt them. For the lions, hunting down large prey like buffalo is a dangerous strategy, but high risk brings high reward. In the wild, a buffalo carcass would provide enough meat to feed an entire pride. Our project site here in Livingston is actually very different to Antelope Park, because here we are walking within a national park. That brings a whole heap of different issues. Most notably, wild elephants, wild buffalo, wild hippo, wild rhino, and crocodiles, because the Zambezi River is just over there. The lions chase the buffalo for more than a kilometer. But in the confusion, Keeler and Kwandi lose sight of Loma. And in the dense bush, the two lions suddenly find themselves face to face with not one buffalo, but two. Buffaloes are one of the, the most dangerous animals in Africa, so we obviously have to take extreme caution just for ourselves. We do have armed scouts here, um, so in the event of a real problem, which we've never had, um, we are able to do something about it. The first thing would be to fire a warning shot, um, and from that the buffalo would run off. Keeler and Kwundi get within meters of the two buffalo, but without Loma, the odds are stacked against them. Their instincts tell them to give up the chase. OK, the lions are losing interest. Let's move out. Keela, come on. Keep moving. And soon, Loma finds her way back to the group. Hey, Loma. Oh. Good girl. Good girl. The three lionesses see David and the other handlers as dominant members of the pride. After their failed hunt, they seek out physical contact and reassurance. These three, uh, yeah, they've had their little sort of hunting session. Now it's a big bonding session. Uh, so here we've got Keela, uh, we have our sister Kwandi, and we have the much more nervous... Here, my girl, Loma. This group are just coming up on 18 months, so they're just in the last couple of weeks of their time walking. The next stage for them is to move on to the Night Encounter program that we're currently building in Danwa Forest, and that's all about learning how to hunt. David leads the lions to water to escape the heat of the African sun. <laughs> we're just trying to keep up, to be honest. Uh, they're extremely active this morning and just running around like mad things, so I'm a bit out of breath. I need to do some fitness training. But they seem to be having a whale of a time. In the African bush, there are dangers all around. When Kwundi stops for a drink, she's not alone. This is a very, very tense moment for us because there's a river. There are lots of crocodiles in here, and actually we can already see two or three uh, just swimming past. Crocodiles are opportunistic predators, and one of the only animals that would attack a lion without provocation. The other two are coming back now. What we'll do is we'll push them to an area which is a bit safer for them. David moves the lions to an isolated watering hole where they can explore in safety. The 
The three females have lived together since they were cubs. Sisters Kwundi and Kila are 17 months old and share a close bond. Loma is the lowliest lion in the group. Where Kwundi and Kila lead, Loma follows, and she often finds herself bottom of the pecking order. Confirm empty door. Kila is the alpha female of the group. As the most confident lion, she's the first to enter the water, closely followed by her sister Kwundi. Lowly Loma hesitates in the shallows. One interesting thing about these three, which is unusual for lions, is that they absolutely love water. But they will even go out of their depth, so they're actually swimming. The lions are led to water every day, and Keela has been a water baby since birth. Look, you see, whole head under. Lions don't do that. Of all the lions that we've raised, I've never seen lions, by choice, fully swim and fully put their head under water. <laughs> yeah. I am fairly confident I, I have one of the best jobs in the world because I get to be not only involved in the day-to-day -day life of these animals, but I'm very much involved in the future for them as well. So I really get the best of all worlds. But this is, this is, this is it really. I'll throw all the rest of it away and just do this.